different way. And uh, really what we're going to do is I want to invite you to go on kind of an imaginative tour with me. And we are going to go visit um, what I think is perhaps one of the most common, if not the most popular, modern-day religious worship center. Okay? And what I want you to do as we do this is I want you to imagine and pretend that you, that we, are actually aliens from Mars, meaning this, I just watched the Netflix series Stranger Things, and so my mind is in like sci-fi. Who here is watching Stranger Things? Raise your hand. We got some claps over here. Man, okay, I see some smiles. So uh, I want you to imagine you are coming to America, and what, we're, what I'm going to describe here, you are experiencing for the very first time with fresh eyes, okay? All right, here we go. So the first thing that we're going to do is uh, we get to this huge parking lot. I mean, it is a maze. And right away we notice all the cars. And so the first thing that we learn about this place is that this is very much a very popular religious center. Cars everywhere. It's packed, just swarming kind of like bees. And so all the cars are parked and people are doing one thing. They have their attention focused on one thing. And that is the entry point to this cathedral. It's these big glass kind of shimmering doors. Everyone's going there. And so you you enter these big glass shiny doors and you get inside. And immediately you notice a couple things. All of the walls are freshly white painted, very shiny. The, the, there's white shiny tile on the floor. And then you, you even, you kind of look up and you, you'll see these skylight windows and the lights coming down through them, kind of almost giving you a sense of transcendence. You also notice though that the horizontal nature of this cathedral, this, this temple if you will, is um, there are no windows. And because I have some inside information, I know that the designers have made this so that you are not distracted by the chaos of the world. There are also no clocks in this worship center. And so time kind of just slips by. And so we've entered through these doors, we see the, the, the tall windows, the walls, the tiles. And right away, we run into kind of a a worship roadmap, if you will. And for seekers, for newcomers, this is particularly helpful. There are all these different colors and symbols and codes kind of pointing out, hey, here here are all the different chapels in this worship center. Of course, if like you're a faithful pilgrim who comes there every week, you don't need that. You already know the layout of the land. And uh, you just go to your place. So we, we move past the, the worship roadmap. We take a, maybe a left-hand turn during, down to our first hallway. By the way, all the hallways look exactly the same. There are banners hanging down everywhere that kind of notify the pilgrims what season they're in. Think of it as kind of a liturgical calendar. And so we walk by, and uh, just like any cathedral, there are stained glass windows. These stained glass windows are a little bit different. They're actually of people just like you and me. They're pilgrims. The difference, though, is, if we're honest, they're a little bit more fit, a little bit more appealing than us, but they're offering you a picture of the good life. They're kind of alluring to you. They, they tempt you and invite you to go into that chapel because you want to become just like them. So, okay. So we go into one of the chapels because we, we see the, these, these life-size icons. And you walk into a chapel and immediately you're greeted by a worship experience host. Very friendly, kind of offers to kind of guide you around this chapel but at the same time, not too pushy, not too obnoxious. And so you can, if you want, you can wander all in there and you kind of have a a vague sense of something that you're looking for. 
a desire, a need, or maybe you know exactly what it is and you're going in there, you know exactly what you're looking for. So you walk around. And there it is, you, you find this holy object, this relic. You got it. And now you are about to enter the, the consummation of your worship experience. And that's because you're going to head to the altar and you're going to meet the priest and you have to give a sacrifice in order to, you know, take home this holy object. I mean, there's kind of this like holy exchange here. I mean, whenever, you know, worship experience, you come in, you're asked to donate money. It it costs something. You give something. But then you also receive something back. And so you go to the altar. You go to this priest with your holy object. You give a cost. There's a holy exchange that happens. The priest is pleased. You've laid down your sacrifice. And now the holy object is yours. And so the priest, he kind of gives you this warm farewell, this benediction, this blessing. He invites you to come on back, which you probably will. And you leave. Anyone here been to this cathedral? Um, I was actually just there last week. One of them, you just go down South Street, past the intersection of Gridley, the Cerritos Mall. <laughs> I'm being serious. It's not, honestly not a joke. Um, the local suburban mall, I think, is a modern worship center, a cathedral, a temple across American cities today. And I remember, I, I, so I read this example in a book by a Christian philosopher named James Smith. And I literally remember reading this and I just stopped. Uh, I told Rachel about it, I was like, whoa, this is crazy. Like, I never have thought of a local suburban mall as like this temple, this cathedral. Sure, are there some exaggerations and some embellishments? Yeah, yeah. But honestly, it's a pretty accurate picture. And so I I start with this illustration, A, because I think it's fascinating, um, but I'm also aware that it's probably maybe a little bit jarring or new to you. But I think there's a reason for that. And I think that's because we wrongly associate worship with just spiritual places and things. We think we wrongly associate worship with just a cathedral, a temple, a worship center. What's fascinating is that the early church, um, let me back up, the culture that the early church was in, they actually thought very similar. They thought worship was a temple, a priest, a sacrifice. That's where worship happened. And so I want us to to, to jump into a passage here, and we're going to begin to kind of unpack everything that I just said. In case you think you're like part of Stranger Things now or something like that. Maybe some of you want to be. I think I might. It's a cool show. So uh, we're going to open up our Bibles here at New Life. We love opening the scriptures. So Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Um, If you're here and you need a Bible, we would love to give you one and to take it home for free. So we have these underneath the chairs in front of you. I'll be reading from page 789. Uh, Romans chapter 12. Quick background. So Paul writes this book. Um, Paul is this traveling missionary, this church starter. And he's writing to this church in Rome. As you can imagine, Rome, really powerful, well-known city, full of culture. And Paul has just spent 11 chapters, thick, dense theology, full of the story of this world and how Jesus has redeemed it. Right, what we call the gospel, the good news of Jesus. There's a page turner, chapter 12, verse 1. Here's what he says. He says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, 
in view of chapters 1 through 11, the gospel, the good news of Jesus, here's what your response should be. To offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. Now, if you grew up in the church, if you've hung around Jesus for a while, chances are you've probably heard this verse. Um, I've heard it a ton of times, particularly around this subject of worship. Right? So the next four weeks here in November, we are doing a whole sermon series just on this topic of worship and looking at it from a bunch of different angles. So you've probably maybe heard this verse before. Um, but for me, last week when I was preparing this, there was something that really jumped out to me that I had never heard before that changes the way that I understand this passage and that I understand worship. And here is what it is. So as I alluded to, the, the culture that Paul's in, that he's writing this to, they had very technical worship ritual language. And so they would use words like temple, sacrifice, priest, altar, so on. You, you kind of get the feel. Paul is using that terminology. So, you know, for instance, right, he uses the word sacrifice. He says, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. That is the technical word for you, for them, going to a temple with an animal, giving it to the priest, which then goes on the altar, etc. Same thing, the word holy. Holy, very technical term, okay? All of this to say, if you're a first century ancient person, whether you're Jewish, which is what Jesus and the early church came out of, or you're a Roman or you're Greek, whatever, chances are worship for you was you went to the temple, you would either have or you would buy an animal for a sacrifice, it would be given to the priest on the altar. That was worship. Very normal. Nothing kind of weird about it. I mean, it's just what everyone did. That was worship. Here's the interesting thing. Paul takes those exact same words and he flips them. He twists them. Here's how he twists them. Worship, sacrifice, all that stuff, is no longer about you going to a physical temple. Actually, your body your whole life is your sacrifice. So he takes their technical terms and he says, eh, worship is no longer going there and doing that with all these things, all these rituals, all these practices. Actually, you yourself, with your body, you now offer a sacrifice of worship. And he says, this is your true and proper worship. Meaning, let me just sum up everything right now. Worship is no longer, this is huge, worship is no longer confined to going to a physical temple, visiting a priest with an altar and an animal as a sacrifice. That's no longer worship. That's what Paul's saying. So this is fascinating because sociologists will tell us the early church, this is, this is so cool to me, they looked really weird. Because everyone else, the word worship meant temple, altar, priest, sacrifice, and they're doing none of those things. So they're looking at them like, you guys are weirdos. They were very countercultural with their worship. So you, me, your actual physical body, your whole life, everywhere you go, and whenever you're there, is your sacrifice of worship. There, um, something that I, that I quote a lot, um, I love the message, which is a non-literal, modern-day translation of the Bible. So don't use it for academics, but use it for conviction. <laughs> Here's how Eugene Peterson translates this verse, and this is so beautiful, and he gets at exactly the point. We'll put it up on the screens. I think you'll catch the drift here. 
So he says this. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your every day, your ordinary life, your sleeping, your eating, your going to work, your walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. That's what Paul's getting at. So hopefully you can see by now all that kind of more technical stuff is worship just on a Sunday morning. Is worship just on a Sunday morning. Okay. I'll make sure that I remember you said that. So all of this makes me wonder, my mind always wonders the things. What would Paul, what would Jesus, what would the early church, what would they think about our whole modern day discussion of worship music? What's called worship music wars. Interesting to think about. Um, Here's what I'm not doing. I'm not dismissing the conversation. And frankly, I'm not even getting into the type of music. Not my point in bringing this up. Here's my point in bringing this up. I think the early church would laugh at us for the worship wars that we have. The real worship war is not the type of music played. The real worship war is what are you doing with your body Monday through Saturday? What if we fought about that? What if we were as passionate about the different types of music played? I'm not getting into that, and I'm not dismissing that conversation. But here's my point. What if we were as passionate about the different type of music played as we are about actually worshiping with our bodies Monday through Saturday? This involves a paradigm shift. So right now we're in a building called the worship center, right? This isn't the only worship center. Your neighborhood is a worship center. Your family is a worship center. Your job is a worship center. Your friends are a worship center. Your gym is a worship center. Your body, your life, your whole self, Sunday through Saturday, is an act of worship. What, here, here's what one commentator wrote. His name is Michael Bird. <clears throat> he, he says this. Worship that is living, holy, and pleasing to God does not take place on some spiritual plane, but occurs through what we do with our physical bodies. You can worship at the street of small very easily. We'll get into that. So here's the thing about worship. It's really about what you value every day of your life, not just Sunday mornings. Same commentator, he says this. He says way things way better than I can. I love this. What we do with our bodies, okay, what you do with your body shows what you value with your soul. What we do with our body shows what we value with our souls. So the word worship in English, you can break it down into two words, worth and ship. I said ship. Um, literally, what that means, it's really simple. It, worship just means to give worth, to give value to something. So when we worship God, we are assigning him worth and value. Worship is about what you give worth to. Worship is about what you value every day of your life. So last week, 500 uh, year anniversary of the Reformation, started by a guy named Martin Luther. Martin Luther, great quote on this topic, he says this, 
whatever your heart clings to and confides in, that really is your God. Whatever your heart clings to and confides in, that really is your God. So what you worship, what you assign value and worth to, that will reveal itself in your everyday life and habits and schedule. Remember, you worship with your physical body. So here's my first question for us this morning. What do you worship? And some of you are probably sitting here right now thinking, what an odd question to ask in a church service. Mark, don't you know I'm a Christian? I have my Bible. I'm here. I do a daily devotional. Like I have a coffee mug with a Bible verse on it. I worship Jesus. What do you mean? This, This sermon isn't for me. I hear what you're saying. I'm not asking you what you believe about God. I'm asking what you do. Because you can have perfect theology. You can have absolutely perfect theology and be very, very, very far from worshiping Jesus in your actual life. So what do you worship? What, what, is, what are your daily habits, your life, your schedule? What do they look like? How do you know what you're worshiping? I think these are some helpful questions for me as I process through this. <clears throat> what am I doing every day? I already mentioned that one. But what do, I, what do I spend like all of my time and energy on? Right? And I'm not talking about, you know, the time and energy you spend on like cleaning your house. Like that. I'm not talking about that unless you're like type A clean freak. Maybe there's some issues there. When you're bored, if you have free time, some of you are like, I don't have free time. Okay, if you're at night laying on your bed and you can't fall asleep, what do you dream about? What, what do you long for? Do you worship sex? Do you worship stability? Do you worship popularity? Do you worship being affirmed? Do you worship your image? Another really easy way to figure out what you worship, especially in light of um, the opening illustration, and as Judah mentioned, that we're getting into the Christmas season, which is crazy, is how do you spend your money every month? Right? What, What do you sacrifice for financially? Money talks. Money will show us what we value. And so there's nothing wrong, maybe be, I always try to be clear, nothing wrong with owning and buying a car. Nothing wrong with owning and buying, you know, a house. Nothing wrong with paying for, you know, your child to be in Little League. If I have a girl, heaven forbid, I spend money on like pageant stuff. Pray, pray people. All those things are fine. I mean, you you guys kind of get what I'm saying here. Uh, Some of those things, okay, maybe they need to be tweaked. Um, But I'm talking about what do you spend an excessive degree on something that you don't really need, right? So like the the daily trip to Starbucks or Del Taco, right, for a sense of comfort. That's what I'm getting at. So here's a moment of transparency. I always try to uh, share a a personal story. (laughs) So... About maybe twice a year, Rachel will debate that and say it's more, um, I go through a stage where I want to buy new clothes. And I'm comfortable in my masculinity this morning, so I can talk about fashion. And so this happened two months ago. And so it started with, you know what, I need two new short sleeve collared shirts. And I need those because... Yeah, you got to think multi-purpose with, like, your, your clothing wardrobe, right? So I get some clothes that I can wear in, like, somewhat of a nice gathering, but then I can also wear them in somewhat of, like, a casual gathering. Like, that, that's how a pastor thinks. So I go and get two short sleeve collared shirts. But what happens next? Well, I think I need a new pair of pants. 
Heaven forbid I use the word outfit. I need a new outfit. Okay. And then I go get the pair of pants. Well, you know what? Oh, I heard it over there. Shoes. Okay. I need a new pair of shoes. Well, here's what I do now because I, I love shopping online. So I buy my shoes from Amazon, but because I'm buying them online and not in person, I buy four different pair, different styles and different sizes. Who here does this? Here's why. You get, I'm, not, I'm not a heathen. So um, I, I can't try them on physically. So, you know, shoes, different companies, they fit you differently. And so I got to have all the different things lined up. I returned the other three, okay? So I do that. Shirt, pants, shoes. And then I, I just went to a wedding. Wow. You know, I'll probably go to another wedding in like four months. So I need, a, I need another suit. That's some of you guys. <laughs> so <clears throat> here's my point. It started off with a really normal need and desire. Nothing wrong with clothes. But then it just kind of goes. It doesn't stop becomes obsessive, becomes compulsive. And then what happens? I end up worshiping it. There are a lot of people, there are a lot of people who believe in Jesus who worship at the street or small. There are a lot of people, there are a lot of people who believe in Jesus who are $5,000, $15,000, $30,000, $50,000 in debt. So this time of the year, are we going to believe that we should sacrifice at the altar of the God of money because he'll give us what we really want? He won't. But that's worship. That's how it works. And so I don't want us to to literally to buy into the lie that money and shopping and fashions and clothes, all that stuff, again, none of it's bad in of itself. But when you start worshiping it, it will not fulfill you. So that's one of the reasons um, churches across the world throughout thousands of years, right, one of the reasons why we take a local offering. Do we need money to like literally keep this place going? Absolutely, right? So that's part of it. But also I think part of it is that God has set up a thing like a tithe, which is giving usually 10% of your income back. Listen to this. As a way to save you from worshiping money. As a way to prevent you from becoming attached and trusting in that the God of money will, will provide satisfaction and fulfillment from you. God is saying, actually, tithe, this is a good thing for you to do because it's actually going to make you attached to me and not to money, which actually can't satisfy you. So worship is a human thing. Worship is not a religious thing. Everyone worships. The question is simply, what will you worship? And that will determine your life very much so in terms of how it will impact you. So it's amazing to me. There is, <clears throat> there's a, well, he's, he's passed away now. A well-known author, his name is David Foster Wallace. And he gave this really famous college commencement speech. And honestly, I, the, he's, the dude is not a Christian, at least from what I know. And you'll, get a, you'll see a little bit of that in his quote. And it shocks me what he has observed about worship as someone who's not following Jesus. And so I just wanted to read a little bit of his commencement speech because he says some highly profound things. Here's what he says, part of it. This is so good. In the day-to-day trenches of adult life, there is actually no such thing as atheism. There is no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. And remember, he's not a Christian. And the compelling reason for maybe choosing some sort of God or spiritual type thing to worship, be it JC or Allah, be it Yahweh or the Four Noble Truths, some set of ethical principles, and oh, this is so good. 
is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough, never feel you have enough. It's the truth. Worship your body and beauty and sexual allure, and you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally grieve you. Worship power, you will end up feeling weak and afraid, and you will need even more power over others to numb you to your own fear. Worship your intellect, being seen as smart, you'll end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. But the insidious thing about these forms of worship is not that they're evil or sinful. It's that they're unconscious. They are default settings. And he ends with this. They're the kind of worship you just gradually slip into day after day, getting more and more selective about what you see and how you measure value without ever being fully aware that that's what you're doing. Isn't that fascinating? Everyone worships, and you become what you worship. So there's kind of this principle or this law to how worship works. And it's you become what you worship. You are what you worship. Or what you worship, you will end up taking on its personality, its characteristics, its traits. So the the scriptures say this. Psalm 115.8. Context of this is idol worshiping. Right? Back in the ancient world, people making their own gods. Here's what the psalmist says. Those who make them will be like them. And so will all who trust in them. You become what you worship. And so think about this. Let's give a couple examples here to be practical. So think about someone who worships money. Slowly, over time, it will begin to consume them. All they'll talk about is the stock market. All they'll think about is the money that they don't have. They'll work 24-7 to get more money. Money, it will consume them. It will define them. Think about the person who worships control. What will they do? Someone who worships control, they're going to do everything they can to to minimize unexpected accidents. But then that's going to make them actually more anxious. And all they're going to do is worry, 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 worry. And then what do their friends say about them? Oh, yeah, he or she's a control freak. Right? What about someone who worships sex? Sure, maybe it starts out as being a little promiscuous during college. But then you're going to end up orienting your whole life around getting more sex. So instead of viewing people as people, you'll view them as a sex object. What they can give you. And so things like love and affection and people become very twisted and distorted. We become consumed with what we worship. And I think the alarming thing, and hopefully you realize this this morning, is that if you're a follower of Jesus, don't think you won't be tempted to worship other gods. You will. There are false idols who compete for your worship, for your worth, for your value. And they will prevent you and they will stop you from finding your ultimate satisfaction and joy in the one true God, Jesus Christ. So here here are the things to think through as we end. Who do you worship? Okay? Who or what do you worship? The way to find out is in your everyday life, what do you give value to? What do you give worth to? What are you sacrificing for? Right? We've seen how all the other counterfeit gods, money, greed, lust, popularity, whatever it is, 
they will always fail you. They will never come through on their promises to give you joy. And so, I think the answer to all this, the, the, the solution, if you want to change your life, change who you worship. If you want to change your life, change who you worship. The reason that we gather here every Sunday morning and we sing songs, we do communion, and we have a sermon, all this other stuff, which remember, that is a very, 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 very small part of your worship throughout the week, right? But we do that to remind ourselves of the one who is of ultimate worth and value, who we offer our lives as a living sacrifice to, Jesus. That is our true and proper worship. And so I think what this may mean, and I don't, I don't like to hear this, is that we remove some of the excess stuff in our lives, entertainment, clothes, but please wear clothes. <laughs> right. Sometimes people take things that you pastors say literally, it's like, oh, okay, I, w- I didn't mean that. But entertainment, food, alcohol, greed, things that you actually don't really need in an excessive degree. Because I think the way that we worship as we approach Thanksgiving and Christmas, where it's all about money and buying and consumerism and getting, if you want to live as a light in this world, which the early church, the way they worshiped, everyone thought they were weird, they were being missional with how they worshiped, is when people see that you sacrifice to the one true God, they'll know that something's different, all right? So let, let's not sacrifice our value and our worth to like Starbucks and Netflix and Gen Korean barbecue, right? Wh- whatever it is, I, I can't name all the things. And so this morning, um, the way we're gonna respond is, is how we do every, every, first Sunday of the, every first Sunday of the month and that we have communion here. And so we're going to take corporate communion as a family. And, and in a couple seconds, um, Juno and, and the servers will come forward. But I think this morning, communion, communion is, is, is a very physical, tangible thing, right, with bread, grape juice, to remind us of, of the body of Christ, the blood of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit uses this time in a very special way to, I think for us this morning to show us who is of ultimate worth and value, the one that we worship. And it's interesting, worship is a response for us, right? We, we sacrifice our lives to Jesus because he first sacrificed for us. And the way that Jesus sacrificed his life for us that he died on a cross for all of our sins. He rose three days later, defeating death. And I think for this morning, the power and the lure and the death of the gods of money and fashion and lust and security and popularity, those gods are defeated at the cross and through the resurrection. And so this morning, we partake in a meal that feeds us and that nourishes us and that shows us that God is good that he nourishes us. And so I'm gonna invite Juno up right now and the servers can come forward at this point. And so we just ask you, um, when you receive the bread, when you receive the cup, just to, to hold on to it together so that we can partake in it together as a family this morning.